Le dédoublement de la personnalité est l'une des plus mystérieuses maladies de l'esprit. Dans le cas de Gary, qu'est-ce qui a pu le pousser à adopter ces personnalités différentes Quelle est la cause de sa maladie Aussi étrange que cela puisse paraître, les psychiatres disent que les gens développent des personnalités parallèles à la suite de traumatismes graves ou en réponse au stress. C'est ce qu'on appelle la dissociation. Les gens exposés à beaucoup de stress disent souvent avoir l'impression d'être sur le point de s'effondrer. Ils ont le sentiment d'être hors d'eux-mêmes. Je crois qu'ils décrivent réellement ce qui se produit quand ils sont soumis à un grand stress. Ils ont l'impression d'être fragmentés et ne parviennent pas à se regrouper pour fonctionner en tant qu'être unique. Il y a encore beaucoup de choses qu'on ne comprend pas à cette maladie, mais un fait demeure. Toutes les personnes qui en sont atteintes ont subi un quelconque traumatisme de manière répétitive au cours de leur enfance. Le 7 décembre 2018, le site Health Europa a publié un article intitulé « Les techniques de neuroimagerie et le traitement du trouble dissociatif de l'identité ». Les techniques de neuroimagerie peuvent faire la distinction entre un cerveau dit « entre guillemets normal » et le cerveau d'une personne atteinte d'un trouble de la personnalité multiple, c'est-à-dire un trouble dissociatif de l'identité, ou TDI. Cela pourrait-il conduire à un traitement de ce trouble des techniques d'apprentissage automatique et de neuroimagerie ont été utilisées afin de distinguer avec précision les personnes présentant un trouble dissociatif de l'identité de celles en bonne santé. Cela en se basant sur la structure de leur cerveau. Publié dans le British Journal of Psychiatry, ces recherches scientifiques pourraient permettre d'améliorer le traitement du trouble dissociatif de l'identité. Des analyses cérébrales en IRM, imagerie par résonance magnétique, ont été effectuées sur 75 participantes à cette étude. 32 avaient été diagnostiquées de façon indépendante avec un TDI et 43 ne présentaient pas ce trouble. Les deux groupes ont été soigneusement sélectionnés en fonction des données démographiques, y compris l'âge, les années d'études et l'ascendance. En utilisant les techniques de neuroimagerie pour reconnaître les modèles d'analyse du cerveau, les chercheurs ont été en mesure de distinguer les deux groupes avec une précision globale de 73% un chiffre nettement supérieur au niveau de précision attendu. Cette recherche, qui utilise le plus grand échantillon jamais atteint un individu présentant un trouble dissociatif de l'identité pour une étude d'imagerie cérébrale, est la première à démontrer que les individus atteints de cette maladie peuvent être distingués des individus en bonne santé sur la base de leur structure cérébrale. Le trouble dissociatif de l'identité, anciennement connu sous le nom de « trouble de la personnalité multiple », est l'un des troubles psychiatriques les plus controversés, et par conséquence avec de graves problèmes de diagnostic erronés. De nombreux patients atteints de ce trouble ont en commun des années et des années de mauvais diagnostics, de traitements pharmacologiques inappropriés et inefficaces, ainsi que plusieurs hospitalisations. C'est le plus grave de tous les troubles dissociatifs. Il implique de multiples identités avec des amnésies récurrentes. Des troubles dissociatifs peuvent s'en suivre lorsque la dissociation est « entre guillemets utilisée » pour survivre à un traumatisme complexe et prolongé pendant l'enfance, alors que le cerveau et la personnalité se développent encore. Le docteur Simon Reinders, associé principal de recherche au département de médecine psychologique de l'Institut de psychiatrie, psychologie et de neurosciences du King's College de Londres, a dirigé l'étude multicentrique. Reinders, commentant l'étude, a déclaré « Le diagnostic de troubles dissociatifs de l'identité est controversé, et les personnes atteintes sont souvent mal diagnostiquées. » À partir du moment où elles commencent à chercher un traitement pour leurs symptômes, jusqu'à recevoir le diagnostic précis de TDI, ces individus vont recevoir en moyenne 4 erreurs de diagnostic en ayant passé 7 ans dans les services psychiatriques. Les résultats de notre étude actuelle sont importants, car ils fournissent la première preuve d'un fondement biologique permettant de distinguer les individus présentant un TDI de ceux en bonne santé. 
A terme, l'application des techniques de reconnaissance des formes pourrait éviter des souffrances inutiles grâce à un diagnostic plus précoce et plus précis, facilitant ainsi des interventions thérapeutiques plus rapides et plus ciblées. Déjà, en décembre 1999, l'émission « Tomorrow's World » de la BBC diffusa une émission consacrée aux troubles dissociatifs de l'identité. Pour la première fois, un patient avec un TDI a été soumis à un scanner IRM pendant la transition d'une personnalité à l'autre. Les analyses ont montré des changements significatifs au niveau du cerveau. Curieusement, l'hippocampe, une zone associée à la mémoire du long terme, s'éteint pendant le changement d'alter et se réactive une fois la transition effectuée. Um, there are a few children, and there are a few, like Elsie, who takes care of the children. And what do you remember after you go back to yourself? Do you remember anything? No. So it's just a blank? It's a blank. I remember nothing. It's quite I don't even realize sometimes that I have switched. That's quite frightening, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Don Condy has been treating Louise for 14 years and has no doubt her condition is genuine. He says that like almost all patients with the rare disorder, it came on as a result of traumatic childhood experiences. When she was a child, because of the horrible abuse that she was suffering, uh, there was no escape except by doing some sort of uh, escape into another part of her of her own mind and letting another personality come out and take the punishment that her mother might be doling out to her. As she's gotten older, that pattern has stayed around. When under stress, Louise says she can still lose hours or even entire days as her other personalities take over to protect her from difficult situations. Despite the experience of patients like Louise, the condition remains controversial. Some feel that the other personalities have been invented by the patient or even by the psychiatrist. This scepticism is partly due to a number of high-profile cases which have cast doubt on the very existence of the condition. This one I killed. One of the most famous occurred 20 years ago when the murderer, Ken Bianchi, used multiple personality as a defense, claiming his alter ego, Steve, carried out the killings. Eventually, he was proved to be faking it. Hi. With Dr. Condy's help, Louise has recently developed an unusual skill. Unlike most multiple personality patients, she can apparently make a switch on demand. All right, well, what I'll do is just count from one to five. Right. Dr. Condy says he isn't using one. hypnosis, simply a technique to help Louise focus. Three, four, five. Oh, bonjour, médecin. Comment ça va? This is Elsie, a French-speaking character. Bon, I am good. Oui. I've been watching. Later, she becomes a child called Watcher. I've been watching. You saw some scary stuff, huh? This ability to switch at will makes Louise an ideal subject for research. Yeah. In the last few years, MRI scanners like this have given scientists unprecedented access to the brain, allowing them to see brain activity actually taking place. The question is, can it shed some light on the mystery of multiple personality disorder? It's something a colleague of Dr. Condi, Goshen Tsai, has wanted to try for some time. There are two problems to do this study. Number one, in the past, we don't have machine like fMRI who can do the study quickly and correctly. Uh, number two, we don't have the right subject, which uh, can con kind of control their switching, because we need to have them to switch on the scanner. Hi, Louise. Hi. My name is Susan. I'm going to be doing your scan. The doctors show us how they scan Louise's brain. Because she can bring on her switching, they'll ask her to change character while the machine is on. She won't be able to move or speak during the test, so she's asked to activate a warning beeper to indicate when she's switched. Okay. I want you to practice with that. Squeeze that ball. Louise is first asked to switch to one of her childlike personalities. Okay, now I want you to switch to Watcher now. Imagine that you're an eight-year-old girl named Watcher. 
You like to watch what happens with Louise. The switch happens, and then they do a control experiment. Louise is asked not to switch, but to pretend to be an imaginary child. I want you to imagine you're an eight-year-old girl named Player. You like to play with a neighbor girl named Helen. The results of the original test on Louise appear to show something remarkable. These colored areas represent a big decrease in brain activity at the very moment Louise switches personality. Intriguingly, it happens in the hippocampus, an area responsible for long-term memory. But there's no change during the control experiment. As you can see here, um, that's a brain structure called hippocampus. That's an area where activity got changed, as highlighted by color here, when she switched personality. So what do you make of these results? Uh, to me, that is saying that uh, there's a brain basis for her uh, personality switching. For Louise, the results are great news. I was ecstatic over the results because I finally, there was finally proof, a way to prove for all those people out there who don't believe that it exists, there was finally proof that it does. Louise is now happily settled with her new husband, Cliff, and hopes before long she'll stop switching personality. The psychiatrist would like to do more tests on her and find other similar patients to see if the results are more than a one-off. If so, it's hoped the work may one day lead to a definitive test for the condition and even new treatments. En novembre 2001, des chercheurs de Melbourne, en Australie, se sont rassemblés dans ce que le Herald Sun décrivit alors comme la première étude mondiale sur le trouble de la personnalité multiple. Le but de l'étude était de tenter de résoudre la controverse au sein de la communauté scientifique et psychiatrique. Les chercheurs ont abouti à la conclusion que les individus souffrant du trouble de la personnalité multiple ne simulaient pas leur changement d'identité. L'étude a comparé les ondes cérébrales d'individus disant avoir un TDI avec celles d'acteurs simulant des changements de personnalité. Bien que les acteurs reproduisaient de façon convaincante des changements d'identité, Les chercheurs ont trouvé qu'il y avait des modifications bien distinctes dans les ondes cérébrales de ceux qui changeaient réellement de personnalité, tandis que ces changements n'étaient pas détectés dans le cerveau de ceux qui ne faisaient juste que jouer la scène. Lors de l'examen de Regina Louf, il était assez évident par beaucoup d'indices qu'il s'agissait d'une personne qui, est, qui, a, qui était gravement perturbée par des abus sexuels prolongés dans la primaire jeunesse. La santé mentale de Regina Louf a été expertisée par un collège de cinq psychiatres nommé par la justice et dirigé par le professeur Rigott. Mais c'est en même temps, et on voit ça très souvent, quelqu'un de solide, d'intelligent qui a gardé intact des mécanismes de défense et de survie formidables. Je crois qu'on peut dire que les abus sexuels prolongés et très graves qu'elle a subis ont donné naissance au développement d'une personnalité multiple avec des alter ego. Les victimes de viol ou d'abus sexuels vous diront J'étais pas là dans ce corps, j'étais ailleurs. Je me dissociais. Quand il y a donc des sévices euh, multiples pendant une longue durée, quand on interroge cette personne longtemps après, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé Il y a beaucoup de matériel qui a été refoulé. On se souvient bien sûr de beaucoup de choses aussi. Mais ces choses-là sont beaucoup moins fiables parce que c'est le fruit de toute une reconstruction, de toute une élaboration de défense. Mais ça n'est pas la folie, ça n'est pas la schizophrénie, ça n'est pas la mythomanie, c'est évidemment la recherche de sa propre histoire, de sa vérité, et c'est un processus douloureux, c'est un processus tâtonnant. Elle avait un problème euh, pour retenir les dates et pour mettre tout sur une ligne de temps. Mais elle donnait assez d'éléments pour faire une bonne enquête. C'était en fait un puzzle qu'on jetait sur une table, mais qui tenait la route et qui était cohérent. 
Et finalement, quand on a parlé avec des magistrats euh, sur les premières déclarations, et quand on lui disait « si on peut, si on nous laisse prouver 5%, Déjà bien, on a déjà bien avancé et on aura une bonne vue sur ce qui se passait dans ce monde à cette époque. identity disorder, it's really, most of the time, the person will appear and act totally normal, uh, totally like everyone else, but under emotional strain, they split into different people. And the host person, the person they usually are, uh, is temporarily absent. And a personality or a part or another person appears, often with a different name. Uh, with different feelings, with different memories, and uh, and most importantly, with often without the host person having any memory that this person has come out. It's a defense mechanism. It's a defense mechanism. So the classic things are things like incest, sexual abuse within a family, or terrible violence within a family, um, or often a combination. So that the kid has no way of dealing with this And the only way to deal with it is to try and pretend to be normal most of the time and then just be completely blown out of the water when the bad shit's happening. And they seem to cover a vast array of emotions. There's yeah. a very masculine yes. personality. There's yes. an overly sexual yes. personality. Is this all within the realm of DID? This is classic within DID. So for somebody who's been sexually abused as a child, let's say within a family, as an incest situation, um, there's going to be a whole lot of feelings about sex that are unbearable. So there'll often be a sexual identity, a sexual part that holds those feelings, thoughts and experiences about sex. Also for the child, there's no way that child can be angry or rageful in a family like that. It's too dangerous, the secret might come out or they get in terrible trouble, or they might even be threatened to be killed. So there'll be often an angry part that holds all the anger. And then usually there's a terribly um, sad, helpless, lonely little girl or child, uh, and that part, the unbearableness of how painful that is. One of the things, Doctor, that I noticed, especially when watching Marcella's video diary, is that there is a change in the eyes whenever there is a different personality. Is that something that you notice as well? There have been a number of brain imaging studies done around the world. So that we do notice, we do find that when people change and they're in a brain scanner, usually functional MRI, something like that, that um, there is a different part of the brain that lights up. Um, so that when they actually shift to another personality, it's a profound brain change. And parts of the brain then activate that are to do with identity. We also do blood pressure pulse um, uh, checks and we find we get a totally different profile in terms of blood pressure and pulse. So when this person changes, it's not just that they're changing their, their name, it's that their physiology changes, their brain patterns change, their skin conductance changes, their voice changes, their eyes change, their demeanor change. They literally become a different person. Hi, I'm Robert Oxnam. Uh, I'm probably best known as an Asia specialist. I used to be president of the Asia Society. Spent a lot of my time focusing on China, writing books, taking people to China. But that's not why I want to talk to you today. Um, there was a whole other side to my life that is the topic of a book that I recently published called A Fractured Mind my life with multiple personality disorder. 
I do have DID. Um, it was diagnosed about 15 years ago. I think we have ago. to make a message about DID, and that is it does exist. It should not be controversial. It is a child's response to enormous trauma. How do you deal with that trauma? One alternative, it turns out, is to fracture, to have parts of you that remember and parts of you that say that's an unbearable memory. I'm going to go ahead and be a creative actor in the outside world. I believe I developed DID by the physical and emotional abuse that I went through, um, sexual abuse also. And I don't, I actually don't really remember much before the age of 12. My understanding of DID in my experience came from childhood trauma, extensive trauma that was repeated. Actually, it took a long time for me to be diagnosed. I met with a number of therapists. I had several hospitalization stays. Essentially a protective mechanism which said it's a horrible memory, you can bottle it up, you can keep it in one part of your internal structure, and you can live a life outside of that. You've just heard a sampling of what it's like to be diagnosed with Dissociative Identity Disorder, or DID, formerly known as Multiple Personality Disorder. Now to most people, including those that are diagnosed, the idea that one could have separate identities or personalities that they have little or no awareness of seems unbelievable. Yet we're going to find that it's much more common than most people realize. We're going to learn how the body is like a house that can have many different personalities. Inside each house is an inner family that one might not be aware exists. When you have DID, these personalities often think and act as if they're the only resident, creating confusion, memory difficulties, and chaos for those who struggle with the disorder. I don't know who I am anymore. Um, confusion plagues me in my mind. Memories surface, memories disappear. I was pretty self-destructive. I drank a lot. I cut, I had numerous suicide attempts, I was depressed, and, uh, and I heard voices. My head was always, always You know, lost. before I was diagnosed with DID, there were all kinds of issues that I found very perplexing. Um, there were blackouts. There were periods of time where I have no memory of what happened. Um, in addition to that, I remember enormous rages. I would be set off and anger would just suddenly well up in me. I was drinking very heavily and people said, aha, it must be alcoholism. You have blackouts with alcoholism. People sometimes get very angry with alcoholism. So it must be something else. I went to a number of different therapists and they were all going around the edges of it. How does dissociating contribute to the development of DID? Well, dissociation is a normal process that we all have capabilities of exhibiting at one time or another. And it's an extremely common response to trauma. They are helpless and unable to fight or flee. So they dissociate, zone out, go somewhere else mentally, or even become someone else, someone who isn't abused or mistreated. As they're off becoming someone else in their mind, they're not aware that their body remains. Some part of them is still being neglected, abused, or traumatized, creating the process in which a traumatized identity It's natural for a young boy to pick a castle, which is just the way we've looked at the world through much of our lives, as if from a, through a castle from the inside out. And I, Robert, lived all these years inside uh, the living room of the castle, looking at a fireplace, coming up with what I thought were great insights and ways of teaching. Um, Bobby lived um, in the dungeon of the castle, a perpetual adolescent, a guy who has all the creativity and the joy and the energy, but he also believes that he's bad and that he deserved the abuse.